minute. Most of you know, uh, member of the. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. As most of you all know, a member of the community passed away, and there are some obituaries you just don't sum up. <laughs> this is what happens when you're late. So. Run the tape again. <laughs> um, Jean. Doyle passed away at her home on Lost Lane April 18th with her loving family at her side and her spring bulbs in bloom. She was born in Newburyport December 16th, 1929 to John E. and Olive M. Wade, weeks after the Wall Street crash of 1929 that ushered in the Great Depression. Jean's love of history was shaped by living through major events in the 20th century. She was proud to call herself a Newburyport native with a special fondness for her years in Joppa. She loved to recall the years she lived next door to the Emma Andrews Library on Purchase Street, where she developed a passion for reading. Jean loved Newburyport and its rich history and would later publish two books celebrating those who made Newburyport a special place to call home. A graduate of Immaculate Conception School of 1943, Jean was the valedictorian of Newburyport High School, class of 47. After graduation, Jean worked at Towles Silversmiths. Like many others of her generation, she chose to work to work over college and then quickly settled into her role as wife to Everett Foley, a mother of seven children, James Foley, David Foley, Jane Watkins, Marsha Foley, Shane Foley, Mark Foley. She was predeceased by her beloved son, John Foley, in 1956. She was predeceased by her husband, Everett Foley, 1986, with whom she enjoyed 38 years of marriage, and Joseph P. Doyle, 2008, with whom she enjoyed 20 years of marriage. At age 33, Jean began taking courses at Northern Essex Community College and transferred to Merrimack College. She was a 1969 summa cum laude graduate at Merrimack College, earning her bachelor's degree in history at age 40. She later earned her master's degree from UNH in 1972. In 1969, she joined the staff of the history department of Newburyport High School, where she was a popular teacher, colleague, department head, mentor, and friend during her 30-year career. At NHS, Jean was a master teacher. Jean's heart belonged to the classroom and her students vividly call, accompanying her to Boston and New York for the Model UN Nations Symposiums, to Washington, D.C. for close-up programs and overnight trips to Gloucester for experimental learning exercises with Project Adventure. Jean enjoyed the camaraderie of her fellow teachers in retirement. She enjoyed attending teachers' luncheons and her NHS reunions. In 2007, Jean published her first book, Life in Newburyport, 1900-1950, a local history bestseller. She poured her heart into capturing the stories of people who survived World War I and World War II and the Great Depression. She considered it an honor to tell this story knowing the struggles so many endured. Her ability to chron chronicle the rise and fall of local political figures and the municipal challenges in a small city brought history alive. In 2010, Jean published a companion edition, Life in Newburyport, 1950 to 1985. Her second book also focused on common people who accomplished so much with so little, despite great adversity and challenge, not unlike Jean herself. She never considered herself a writer, but a recorder of local history. Always willing to present both sides, Jean thought of her books on Newburyport as a gift to the community and to future generations who would call Newburyport home. Jean's second book was recognized by New England Book Festival in 2010, and in 2012, the American Association of State and Local History learned of Jean's life and work and selected her for a National Lifetime Achievement Award given only to a select few. In a letter from the Selection Committee, organization executives wrote, this is the nation's most prestigious competition for recognition of achievement in state and local history. We congratulate you, congratulate you for the work that has brought this honor. In 2015, Jean was the honoree of the Newburyport Literary Festival and fettered for her work as history teacher at NHS and for authoring the two valuable local history texts. As a local, Jean wrote with authority on the personalities that powered the city's comeback during urban renewal in the 1970s and 1980s. April 25th, 2015 was declared Jean Foley Day. 
by Mayor Donna Holliday in recognition of her years of teaching and her publications. Jean was a member of the Ladies of Christopher, Great Books, Museum of Old Newbury, Newburyport Society for the Benevolent Protection of Women, Custom House Maritime Museum, Newburyport Retired Teachers Association, Newburyport Public Library, News and Views, her local book group and locals writers group that provided encouragement during the writing of her two books. She served as an incorporator of the Institute of Savings. She was a devout Catholic and lifelong member of the Immaculate Con Conception Parish. She was determined to continue to share her wealth of new report history and in conjunction with the local community, TV channel wrote, edited, and produced the following documentaries. New Report in World War II, Joppa Girls, Irish in New Report, The French Canadians in New Report, all available on YouTube. She was a physical fitness inspiration known for her five mile power walk gym power walks up and down High Street and hours spent on the elliptical machine at the gym. She believed exercise gives you energy and never accepted the fact that there are 24 hours in a day. Devoted gardener, walker, reader, and traveler, Jean loved returning to her home and her garden where she found peace and happiness throughout her life. In her later years, Jean found much enjoyment in planting gardens, starting with magnificent display of tulips and daffodils. Local gardens were started from perennials Jean shared from her Low Street and Rolfs Lane gardens. She was survived by 11 grandchildren, five great grandchildren, many nieces and nephews, as well as countless numbers of friends. So with that, let's remember Jean's family and also remember her tomorrow on Jean Doyle Day. A moment of silence. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please. I'd be happy to call the roll for the meeting at 7 p.m. with the Newport City Council, April 24th. Council McCauley. Here. Council Preston. Present. Council Vogel. Present. Councilor Wallace is absent. Councilor Wright. Here. Councilor Z. Here. Councilor Cameron. Here. Councilor Dunyu. Present. Is remote and present. Thank you. Councilor Cobb. Present. Councilor Lane. Not here. Is absent at the present moment. Councilor Shan. Present. We have nine uh, present, uh, one remote, and two absent. We have a quorum. All right. Late files. There's one late file you'll see on their desk. On your desk, it's order 449. Approving Shared Streets Grant, High Street Traffic Calming, sponsored by Councilor McCauley. Motion to waive the rules, accept the late file, and then uh, move it to public works and safety. Second. Roll call. This is on the motion to move to uh, public works and safety. Councilor McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Zeed. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Dunyu. Yes. 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 Thank you. All right, public comment. All right, for those that are on Zoom, please raise your hand while the clerk walks to the door to pick up the list of folks who will be speaking for public comment. Once the, so I see Christopher Silva. Are there any other hands for public comment? Please raise them now. Once the clerk returns to the dais, going to close public comment for those on Zoom. So Christopher Silva is the only hand I see. All right, we will start with Christopher Silva. So Mr. Silva, your name, your address, and two minutes. Anything else? That is all. All right, thank you. All right, so we will go to public comment in-house. We have first on the list, Ben Iacono. Good evening, 
My name is Ben Icono for LC Drugs. I'm here to speak of my concerns regarding Ordinance 149. I communicated with each of you at this, this past weekend of these concerns and would just like to emphasize looking at the big picture. The tone and requirements being presented in Ordinance 149, as well as Ordinance 129, currently still in committee, are sending the wrong message to the number of individuals and benevolent organizations that for many years have been volunteering thousands of hours and have been, been instrumental in providing millions of dollars in financial support to the citizens of the city. In an attempt to fix a problem, the approach that is being taken has the potential of breaking the spirit of giving in this community. Every benevolent organization is being stained and affected by an overreaching approach that, rather than facilitates the proper and legal relationships, is creating barriers in what should be a collaborative but separate type relationship. It is not enough to simply state that the city is appreciative of the efforts by citizen-based friends groups, then turns around and places reporting requirements that are unnecessary and intrusive. I urge you to do the right thing for this community. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Krista Yablin. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Krista Yablin. I live at 76 Mosley Avenue, and I've lived in Mosley Avenue for over 17 years. The speeding on Mosley Avenue has gotten worse over the years. I actually call it Mosley Speedway, since no one goes the speed limit of 25 miles an hour. I've complained to the previous administration and they finally put two speed limit signs down near the rotary. However, there are none when you enter the start of Mosley Ave where Atkinson Common is located. If the police would come between 6 and 8 a.m. or 4 to 6 p.m. during rush hour, then they would see how all the fly cars fly down the street. I'm sure that you'd be shocked at how fast they drive on Mosley and be stopping se several cars of speeding. Once the rotary was built, we finally got some sidewalks coming on Mosley Avenue from the rotary. However, we did not have one consistent side of the street with sidewalks. Children's bikes, families going to Mosley Wood must walk on people's grass or hope that if they walk in the street, they will not get hit. Our neighbors have been vocal about the issues on Mosley Avenue with the previous administration and counselors at no avail. Councillor Christine Wallace has met with us and heard our complaints, and we appreciate all our efforts to get our voices heard. When Mayor Reardon was campaigning and knocking on doors, he asked me what I would like to see in Newburyport if he was elected. And all I said was, help with the speeding on Mosley Avenue and have one side of the street have a consistent sidewalk so that we can be safe going to the parks or downtown, and that would be great. I asked the City Council and the Mayor to take an in-depth look at the speeding on Mosley Avenue and figure out some options to calm the traffic down with stop signs, crosswalks, bike lanes, to name a few. But most importantly, please finish the sidewalks on Mosley Avenue, which consist of only four houses on the whole street that were started when the rotary was installed so that we can let our residents have a safe way to be able to access Atkinson Common and Mosley Ave. Thanks for the consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brittany Verville. Nailed it. <laughs> That's a fun one. Good evening. My name is Brittany Verville, and I reside at 77 Mosley Avenue here in Newburyport. In my multi-year tenancy owning the property, speeding has always been a concern. My neighbors and I have sent numerous emails to the city through the counselors of the ward, had petitions signed by the local neighboring community in hopes to accomplish two things. One, slow the traffic down to the posted 25 mile an hour limit, and two, finalize the missing sidewalk along the four houses of Mosley Ave to support safe passage down the street. The greatest movement we've had over my years living in this house are two speeding signs, two speed limit signs, excuse me. Much like raising children, rules are not worth having unless they're reinforced and supported. As someone who's been previously hit by a car in Massachusetts in a crosswalk, the safety of our own community and my own backyard is top of mind for me. The stopping distance at 25 miles an hour is 85 feet. The stopping distance at 35 miles an hour is 136 feet. I ask for your consideration in finalizing the missing sidewalk along those four houses that have never had such, and I ask for your consideration to put the safety of my future child at the forefront of your minds and enforce the speed and limits posted on our street. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jane Snow.
um, evening, Jane Snow, 9 Coffin Street. I am going to speak uh, about the uh, CPA projects, and I do understand that that you probably can't do anything, but I would like to voice my concern. I did go to the presentations, and I did go to <clears throat> the budget and finance, and a couple of the projects that I saw concerned me, and one of them is, is that we sold the museum to the owners for a dollar, and the promise was that they would take care of the maintenance of the museum, and they do have an ask in during this round of um, grants. The other thing is, is there's a grant asking for some research to be done for the kids to do, um, I don't know if you call it trick bike riding or bike riding that's currently at Marches Hill, and I guess what I would ask you is to consider the fact that we have a couple of projects that are close to finishing, such as the tower in Atkinson Common. And for me, it would really be a heaven sent, and I said this at the uh, meeting, to use that kind of money to finish up that project. And it would be so nice to have a project completed. Instead of the committee trying to raise money, they wait five years, and half of what they the work they did is now not in good shape because they've had to wait for the five years. So I know that that's probably nothing that you can do, but I still want to um, voice my concern that when we give out these funds, I wish we could do it in a manner that a project would actually get done and we take in consideration as to how much money each person has, each organization, whatever, has gotten over the years and maybe even considering that you only can apply and get a grant every two years, every three years, and how much money the total can be. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dave Mosley, Deb Mosley. Hi, I'm Deb Mosley. I live at 126 Merrimack Street here in Newburyport. Been a resident here for a little over 40 years now. Uh, I am the vice president of the Friends um, of the Council of Aging, Aging and soon to be president. And Ben has been representing us quite gallantly regarding the Ordinance 149. And it's time now I'd like to speak up. First of all, the, our mayor himself has been asking for volunteers in this community often. This ordinance is putting fear and anxiety already in our board members. What you're presenting is asking us to give up donors and to do things and to define gifts is something that we um, have not been, I guess, um, cognizant of our differences until now. In the future, and I'm getting a little nervous here, so I apologize, so let me just look at my note for a minute. Um, we uh, raise funds to augment. We raise funds to help the city to reduce taxes so you don't have to buy vehicles and that such things. If you do this and you ask us to give over our donor lists and the amounts of money and everything else that is privately held by, this, uh, by the friends in respect of the privacy of the people, the way we give gifts may end up being very different. It will focus on the residents here in Newburyport to enrich their lives by providing programs, not as gifts to the city, but as gifts and good stewards of the money that has been donated to the senior center for those at the senior center. So I really would like you to reconsider this. We are not employees of the city of Newburyport. We are a group of professional volunteers. And we are professional in the sense of we are teachers, professors, superintendents, engineers. We check out our finances monthly. And Ben has done an awesome job in, in doing this um, with all of us. So I just want, again, to ask you to reject um, 149 and to, um, that's about it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks. Next is Sally Wynn. Hello, good evening. My name is Pavel Zakovic. I am uh, uh, residing at 78 Mosley Avenue. I would like to support the voice of my neighbors, uh, Krista and Brittany, 
and stress the importance of the safety of um, Mosley Ave. And to add that between my home and my neighbor's house, we have six children aging four to 10. And um, obviously the safety of them is the most important thing we, we care about. And adding the sidewalk would tremendously help us uh, keep them safe and do simple things, uh, walk to school, bike to school, instead of driving. Um, and um, give them a little bit more freedom and um, space. Thank you. Thank you. And last is Stephen Kurz. Hi, good evening. I'll make this quick. I'm also from Mosley Avenue, uh, joining my neighbors, and I can't really add much more Address. to what. I'm sorry? Address. 79 Mosley Avenue. Sorry. I can't really add much more to what they've already eloquently said tonight. Um, I can say this, I've lived in Newburyport 31 years, lived at Mosley Avenue 23 years. I've been personally asking for sidewalks for about 12 years. To me, to have sidewalks around this city prioritized based on aesthetics, replacement for existing sidewalks, when we don't even have sidewalks on Mosley Avenue, is a shame. The last couple of years to see arguments take place about people choosing between bricks or not bricks, we can't even get houses, four houses, get sidewalks in front of it, it's a shame. I've also sadly seen what happens when you don't have sidewalks. I was um, unfortunately someone who actually saw some people lose their lives uh, because they're walking in the street in Newburyport on a snowy night, and I think that that uh, was linked to this, people that worked in this building. Uh, so I know what happens when you don't have a place to walk and you have to walk in the street. I hope that the sidewalks can be addressed sooner than later. The speed limit in our city is out of control. I get to travel all over this country for work and a lot of cities are judged on whether or not you have calm speed limits. And here, almost any day of the week, you go through Newburyport, and to go near any of our main arteries, you're sort of taking your life in your hands. I remember the last administration, I brought up the fact I couldn't find a speed limit sign in the city anywhere. I think the two signs that were put on our street were five signs were at, that were added to the whole city. This was only like three years ago. So you come to this city, you don't even know what the speed limit is. You sort of assume it's 35 or 30. Thank you. If I could add one more closing sure. point. To say on uh, the signs that have been added, which are a great improvement, that 25 miles an hour and put in the crosswalk you have to add to those signs citywide. The devil's in the details. That's what all the neighboring towns did. Newburyport should, if they're going to put up more signs, which I'm sure they will this spring, add that detail. Thank you. Thank you. And that is it for public comment. Thank you all. Uh, mayor's comment. All right, good evening. You're all doing well. Uh, I wanted to first say thank you for mentioning uh, Mrs. Jean Foley Doyle tonight. Uh, I had Mrs. Doyle for my freshman year homeroom. And you know that was a very detailed uh, obituary that, that we all got to read in the paper, and it was right on the money. Uh, she was history in the report, I would say. Uh, I was a history major. I went on to, to Ohio State and, and uh, majored in history. But growing up in the report, we live in such a, a great place to, to foster that love of history. And Mrs. Doyle certainly did that. And she, you, you would see her at the fitness factory back in the day, and you would get tired watching her work out. She <laughs> was just that good. Uh, so again, just heartfelt condolences to the family, you know, her daughter Marsha is on the licensing board here in your report as well, but just very, very involved family, so uh, hearts go out to them. I want to thank everyone who came. This is not a drill. Jim, what did you do? All right, we're going to pause. Looking for a way 
ways to help our planet today. So we have eight stations set up down in Market Square. Uh, we run around composting, waste reduction, recycling, solar, energy efficiency, walking, biking, less driving, food, natural resources, and up, uh, upcycle, repurpose, and repair. Uh, and what's great about this is that these are not like vendors, like no one was trying to sell you something down there. This was really just community information. They were manned by residents who could actually talk about their experiences around these eight action items. Uh, and it was really great. So again, I hope we, we do it more. I want to thank Clark Jones for braving the elements on his electric motorcycle to come down and be with us. But uh, it was great, 10 to 2. And like I said, we had a lot of great foot traffic. Uh, the budget process is moving on finally this week, so the schools will be voting on their part of the budget tomorrow night. Uh, and then we will move forward. I will submit my budget for your next meeting on May 8th. Uh, I want to thank Councilor Zeed for putting together the budget hearing schedule. Uh, and I know this is a really tough stretch for everybody, right? Particularly for you all here and uh, you know, some of our uh, city department heads as well. Uh, but we're just excited about this process. I think we're going to have a great budget that we put forward to you uh, that's really going to provide the highest level of services and moves our community forward. Uh, and I just want to give you a little heads up. Uh, you know, last year we, we, we focused on a few different uh, focus areas uh, in the city. This year, uh, we're going to be looking at planning, IT, and DPS. So I just want to give you a little, little heads up for that. Um, and we're also at the same time, so you'll be uh, doing this uh, together this year, but the CIP will be submitted as well. Uh, we're still working through that. Uh, again, this is a five-year look, but then we're just identifying funding sources for all the targeted FY24 projects. Uh, the fire chief search will continue this week. Again, thank you to Councilor Preston and Councilor McCauley for being a part of this process. Uh, the fire chief assessment center will be Thursday this week at the senior center. And we have three, from what I'm told, great candidates going through the assessment center. Uh, and we will look forward to that. And then after Thursday, they get the scores immediately. So then uh, the screening committee can decide who will go on to final uh, interviews with me, which will be exciting. Uh, 59 Low Street, uh, this was in the paper, but EGA was chosen uh, as the architect for the uh, final design of 59 Low Street for uh, Newport Youth Services. So we're excited about that. We've worked with EGA quite a bit, and we're excited that they were awarded the bid. Uh, again, they've put a lot of work into this, and they've been really great to work with. Uh, in your packet tonight, there's a, a first Pride Parade uh, for 2023. Uh, we're excited about this. You know, we, we looked for residents to come forward and join this uh, board last year. Again, this is kind of a subset of the uh, DEI Alliance, uh, but we had some really great residents come forward, and they're really excited about, about working together to put, uh, you know, plan events not only for June, which is Pride Month, but for, to plan events all around uh, the year as well. So we're excited about that. Uh, and again, you'll be hearing about that tonight. And I think a parade would be a, a great addition to, to start kind of kicking off the summer here uh, in Newburyport. Uh, NYS had a great uh, break, a school break was this past week. I think they had over 150 kids uh, participate in programs. They did over 12 programs this week. So again, they were busy uh, and it was great for all those kids that didn't get to go down to Florida or, or wherever, uh, like my kids. Um, but it was great that they were busy and, and kept kids engaged during the week. And finally, May 4th, finally coming up. I talked about this last year. We didn't get to do it last year, but we're, we're finally doing it this spring. But I'm having my first boards and commissions fair. Uh, all of our boards and commissions will have over 25 tables set up in the auditorium on May 4th from 6 to 7.30, where residents can come in and just get to know our boards and commissions, learn a little bit about them. And so when we do have uh, openings that they uh, you know, again, they can go after the, the boards that, they, that, that piqued their interest. But uh, I want to thank all our great volunteers already on our boards and commissions, particularly the chairs who have been helping us with this effort. And uh, again, we're going to have all these tables manned, um, attended on uh, May 4th. And again, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for residents to learn more about these uh, critically important boards that help make your report go. That's it from me. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Cameron. I, I, I think we would like to I celebrate your very special day Saturday. Birthday. <laughs> birthday or birthday? It was both. But yeah. Want, I, we all want to wish you a happy belated birthday. Uh, we have cake in the office if you get a little hungry during this 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 uh, meeting. So. Yeah, I've been here for general government. There was cake. Oh. Lots of cake the last couple of days. So I hope you guys could help me out. That would be great. All right. Have a great meeting. Thank, Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Moving right along, consent agenda. The consent agenda consists this evening of the approval of the minutes for April 10th. There are a number of communications. Uh, the first two are going to license and permits. Application 132, the Pride Parade, uh, we just heard about. Application 133, the Lions Club uh, annual, August 1st, 8 a.m. 8.30 p.m. 
And then uh, the remaining communications, the first one is receiving file communication 478. FY 24 budget process. The next four are all going to uh, public works and safety. Communication 479, Ward 4, street sidewalk traffic safety priorities. Communication 480, Merrimack Street safety items. Communication 481, updated park list with sketches. Communication 482, construction projects at the central waterfront. There are two transfers, both on the budget and finance. Transfer 151 is uh, from retained sewer retained earnings, 120,000 to plant chemicals, same amount. And water retained earnings, 86,000 to plant chemicals, same amount. Transfer 152, IT salary director, 14,006. And the auditor's salary, financial purchasing annual is 15,000. And um, salary staff, 16,000. All to IT news license, 14,000. And IT software, 32,000. Following appointments are coming in. Appointment um, 389, Tara Cedar Home, 20 Fruit Street, to Fruit Street Historic Commission until 430, 2026. Next is appointment 390, Caitlin Hare, 43 Prospect Street to the Board of Registrars until 5-1-2026. That's to go to general government. The following are reappointments. Appointment 391, Mark Sedrin, 91 High Street, Historic Commission until 5-1-2026. That's to go to Planning and Development. Appointment 392, the same individual going to the Fruit Street Historic District until 4-30-2026. Appointment 393, Jeanette Isabella, 100 Water Street, to the M. Andrews until 5-1-2024. Appointment 394, Madeline Nash, 19 Arlington Street, Affordable Housing Trust until 5-1-2025. That's to go to Planning and Development. Appointment 395, uh, Paul Harrington, uh, 251B High Street to the Tree Commission until 5-1-2026. Appointment 396, Jane Healy, 38 Winter Street, to the Community Preservation until 5 1 2026. Again, planning and development. And lastly, appointment 397, John Green, 12 Finnegan Way, to the Council on Aging until 5 1 2026. <coughs> Excuse me. The following items are removed from the respective committees with this vote Budget Finance, Orders uh, 434, 441, 442. Transfer 150 and order 435. Community services, ordinances 148, 149. General government, order 438. Communications 472, 476. License and permits, application 130, communication 475. Public works and safety, communication 473. And that is the, is the uh, consent agenda this evening. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. <coughs> On the motion to approve consent agenda, Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Zeed? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Motion to receive and file the mayor's update. Second. Roll call. On receiving file the mayor's update. Councilman Carley, yes. Preston, Vogel, yes. Wright, yes. Z, yes. Cameron, yes. Dunyu. Council Dunyu. Uh, skipping Councilor Khan. Yes. Councilor Lane. Council Shan. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Donahue, you are muted. Councilor Dunyu, that is a vote on the uh, mayor's update receiving file. We we'll vote. Okay. <clears throat> she unmuted, so maybe she's. Councilor Donovan. I can't hear a thing. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. We had a vote on receiving and file the mayor's update, and your vote would be? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I don't know why that's happening. All right. No appointments, no communications, no transfers. Moving on to orders. Off to orders, and we have quite a lot of them. 
Uh, we have an emergency preamble for order 443, which is the Parks Align Gift Acceptance. Motion collectively to waive the rules, approve the emergency preamble 443 and the underlying 443 itself if the clerk wishes to read it. Roll call. That means the clerk didn't. Uh, roll call. <laughs> this is the whole thing. Okay. This is the whole thing for acceptance of Order 443 and to approve uh, the emergency preamble. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Zeed? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunning? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Kahn? Yes. Councilor Shan? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Did it take 444 through 448 collectively? Marvelous, thank you. Second. Roll call. Can we read them for the record? For the record, we have collectively a motion to refer to budget and finance. Uh, order 444, which is the Central uh, Congregational Church gift acceptance. 445, uh, Friends of NYS gift acceptance. 446, Friends of the Report Trees, gift acceptance. 447 is the FY23 Revolving Fund Spending Limit Increase order. And 446 is the PCB Class Action Settlement Payment acceptance. All to go to budget and finance on this vote. Roll call. <clears throat> yes. The um, raising of the spending, can you repeat what that was for? Annually, there's a revolving fund that comes in from the uh, finance director, and the spending limits are often increased. I can look at it. Would you like more specifics? Uh, you know, is in general or to a specific? Um... In general. This is an this increase for a couple of them through the rest of the fiscal year. So. Um, I see. Okay. Disability programs and senior. Community. Are you all set? Okay. Sorry. All no right. problem. Um, so, roll we'll call on that collective motion. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Council Wallace? Council Wright? Yes. Council Zian? Yes. Council Cameron? Yes. Council Dunahue? Yes. Council Kahn? Yes. Council Shan? Yes. Thank you. The last one we already did. Order 449, which is the late file. Um, you had already referred this to Public Works and Safety. Public yes. Works and Safety. Thank you. Then we are down to ordinances, Council President. Got it. Ordinance 143, first reading, municipal fee schedule. This, as you remember, was on the floor with a motion to approve. It has now been moved to a date certain, as in tonight. So, um, Councillor McCauley, I think uh, he's going to step motion in. Motion to approve? Yes. Yeah, there already is a motion to approve, actually, by. Let's do a new motion to approve. Council Wallace is not here. Okay. And that was seconded by? I'll second. I'll okay. Either way. Councillor Zaid. Motion to amend. Um, I, I printed out paper copies just to make it easier, and I'll, if the president will give me a second, I'll, I'll explain what they are. If you don't mind, thank you. Um, so the changes are on page two and page four of this printout. Um, first thing is in the last meeting, we amended to uh, insert the system development fee as it was noted in the memo, but not noted in the ordinance itself. So I, I inserted that, but if, you, if you'll notice on the right, um, essentially what I propose is, is phasing in the fee. Uh, it was proposed at 2,500. That was the amendment that passed last time. Um, but I put in um, 1,000 per unit through next June, 1,500 per unit for another year, and then 2,500 uh, thereafter. And then on the last page, I'll just explain what they are, and then I'll give you my rationale. On the last page, um, made some clarifications on the left side as to what the fee is. This was based on what we learned from the memos that were distributed earlier today about what the hydrant charge is, because uh, they both previously just said hydrant charge, which was a little bit confusing. And then on the right side, the annual hydrant charge for Newbury also has a phase in now uh, by this amendment. And um, so in terms of uh, rationale, um, I had some time to think about this. I had raised some questions on the floor, and I'm appreciative for the information we got back from the administration. As far as the system development fee goes, I think my, my view on it um, is that 
we have to recognize that when large developments come online, they are potentially requiring systems to expand in a way that you're not going to recapture that simply from rates. And there's probably some realistic idea about balancing how much of that comes from that new development, things you may have to do that you wouldn't otherwise do, say, to the water system in this example. Um, and you know, with Plum Island, for example, we had a direct betterment. We don't typically do that. But when you have, say, 80, 100, 200, 500 units come online, <clears throat> at some point you have to recognize that that's going to have an impact on the overall system beyond just that connection at that point. However, um, this is a fee that's never really practically existed. It sounds like maybe it was done at some points you know, by, by subjective nature as a, as a tech review type mitigation fee. So I thought phasing it in would at least give some, you know, some ramp instead of just jumping in at, at $2,500, but in, in the same, in the same, at the same token, respecting uh, that that's where they wanted to go with it. And then on the last page, um, besides the clarifications, just so at least you can understand what the fees actually are, the annual hydrant charge is essentially the way I look at it, based on the memo, is an amortization of the cost of a hydrant over a period of its life um, and that they weren't ma basically making their bones at $75. So uh, they wanted 150. I just made a, a ramp again because that is paid by the town of Newbury and they have done their budget for the next fiscal year. So sort of out of respect for our neighbor, let them finish the year so they don't have to try and find a transfer and then take in effect our fiscal year start next year. So those are my suggestions. Otherwise, the double underlines are what you, what you found from the original proposal and remain unchanged. So that's my suggestion that, that I thought could help ameliorate this proposal. Further questions? Councilor Kahn. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Um, I just want to get clarification on the system development fee, and maybe it's just a matter of the language. So I, I completely understand and I appreciate actually talking through what these are. So if we're phasing, um, and just to talk about what this is, so uh, charge per unit for multi-unit dwellings, so multifamily. So every unit is this, this amount that we're talking about. The phasing in proposed is that until like the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, it's going to stay at 1,000, which is what it was before. Just want to clarify, because that's what's confusing me a little bit. Oh, yes, thank you. So this fee never existed. So right now it's zero. And this proposal is actually not this fiscal year end, but next year, oh, 2024. Yes, so would, yes, if, if a project gets permitted between the acceptance of this and that date, it would be 1,000 per unit. So if it's 10 units, it's 10,000. If it's 100 units, it just it scales. Got it. Thank you, thank you. So right now there is nothing. Right. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing then, once we pass this, once we pass this, they will then have till next year, June, um, and it'll be $1,000. Um, and then in terms of the rationale to phase it after that, uh, I believe the first one was 2,500 was gonna be the proposed change. Uh, is there any data, because I appreciate that there is an end goal, you know, like that we're kind of giving a nod to the 2,500, but uh, really I think it comes down to my, and I wasn't at any of the meetings, but the basis for that fee, I think it'd be helpful to understand. I'm sure I think, um, my apologies if the, uh, the, uh, the sponsor of these amendments said that, but if you don't mind being a little bit more clear uh, or from what you learned from the, the meetings and information on what the basis is for that, that charge, the 2,500, which is where we're kind of phasing to go to. Councilor McCauley. Yeah, so to answer that question, uh, uh, as part of that, we did talk about this in committee uh, a little bit. And uh, the answer is that um, it's almost like a high level and low level design in other aspects of our business, right? And this, um, uh, when they design these water um, uh, solutions for these multi-tenant um, type of um, uh, developments, uh, it is much more complicated than just one or two, um, uh, one line divided by five or six or something like that. It has downstream effects of um, water pump, um, uh, you know, pumping stations both in and out, water and sewer. And they, uh, we've been doing these designs for free. We've been doing these designs as part of our plan. And now uh, for some of these larger ones, um, the concept is that we'll be doing these designs for fee. And that's simply it. 
Councilor Zeeg and then Councilor Collins. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to try and answer too. Um, you know, the best, the problem is, is that this is the way I look at it and my understanding is you're trying to amortize large scale costs that maybe happen over a long time, but that you're trying to attribute some of that to each underlying development that comes through. So in other words, in five years from now, you might have to make a relatively major upgrade to the plant to say increase capacity as a result of three developments that came line on. And, but you can't go back five years later and say, if it wasn't for your development, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had to have done this. So the best, that the, in the memos that were provided today, there were some comps provided, which I know has been something that we talk about with other things. But I guess other communities do a per bedroom fee, which is interesting. If switch does 1500 per bedroom. Danvers uh, was quoted in the memo as $1,980 per bedroom. So, uh, you know, is there a specific thing? And, you know, then there was the environmental partners slides, which we all received as well, but they don't come to a specific point and say 2,500 is the right number. So I'll be honest, I mean, my sense is the 2,500 is a bit of a triangulation around sort of what they think the idea would be and what would be reasonable, say, on a 80 or 100 unit building compared to other communities. Um, there was also a suggestion that you could do it subjectively and try and figure it out as you go, but it, it seems like this is more uniform and, and that's why with a phase in, I think you know, it's, it's supportable. And then last, thing, last but not least is we have these very large water you know, projects that in theory we talk about and um, if we just put the cost on all the rate payers all at once instead of at least trying to make an effort to attribute costs to different things, it's more painful potentially on those who don't necessarily own own that need. I don't know if that helps, but that's what the memos show. And Andrew maybe wants to say his own thing to help. Councilor Khan. Um, yeah, my apologies for missing the memo. Is that when it first came in? That's what the memo you're referring to? It came in actually today. Okay, they I were, did not see the yeah. memo. But here's a couple of things I'm thinking about. Um, one is uh, this the, the phasing. I, I can see the rationale for it. But one of the things with the municipal fee schedule is that we could look at it annually. So I'm not a little cl clear in terms of why we already kind of staking it. It looks like there's data, there's information behind it. What I would rather do is that we approve what we can with the 1,000 per unit. Because I think there's a lot to be seen with multifamily dwellings. You know, the definition is it four or more units. You know, what's that definition? That would, to me, need to be defined. I'm also thinking of, um, you know, as we look at affordable housing and the number of multifamily dwellings, it's it's under it's good to understand the impacts on this type of cost. Who does it? Who is it going to fall on? Is it, is it just mainly new development? But there's so many different aspects that I'd like to understand. So I'm wondering, is um, I would actually. Uh, like to just see us do 1,000 per unit and then revisit this when we look at our municipal fee schedule. So um, can, can someone uh, maybe answer why we're phasing? And even with the hydrant issue too, why not just put it at one value and not have this uh, stake in the ground on the future? So Councilor Vogel, you have your hand up. You haven't Thank spoken you. and then Councilor Z. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to the reason that I'm rising is because I'm, I'm kind of a bit taken aback that this is something um, so new um, right here. Again, I didn't make the meetings either, and you're telling me that the data came in um, this afternoon. Um, it, it, is, is there another place that the system development fee could, could reside? I mean, so maybe we could at least debate that and come to an understanding of that particular item. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the, you know we, we do like the in my opinion, I do like the buildings that are going up around the, you know, the train station and so forth. And there's a couple, you know, hundred thousand dollars, or, uh, or you know, he's got 80 units in there. It's eighty thousand dollars for, you know, working on the water. I, I agree. I, I do believe that we should be charging for it. I just feel like this is brand new and haven't had an opportunity to learn more about it. Maybe it's just me, and if that's the case, I do apologize. But I'd like to see it maybe discussed a little bit deeper. Councilor Zaid. Um, I just want to, again, try and answer some of the questions. So I think you're right. It, it, there is a question about whether you like the $2,500 number or not. Um, assuming you have some interest in that number or some see some value in it, I think it's nice to show where we're going. Uh, these are long-term development projects. If somebody's working a pro forma or something like that, then it's nice to see what the horizon is. Um, we've done this with other things like parklets, and I just think it establishes what sort of the actual fee is and then it, it lets people see what's coming, but not to shock them uh, with it. On the hydrant specifically, um, 
you know, I think the, the, what, what the memo basically said is at $75, they charge that for, say, 20 years. They don't come up to, they, or they only come up to roughly half the cost of what it costs to replace the hydrant, which means the system is paying for the other half, which is another way of saying the ratepayers are paying for the other half. So the idea of raising it to 150 was to try and go from half to, to whole, so that when you get to the end, essentially you've put enough money in the bank that you can replace that hydrant dollar for dollar with the hydrant fee. The phasing is really just a courtesy, frankly, to our neighbors uh, who, like us, run on a fiscal year. And if they come up short in the line, they have to do a transfer. So this is just a neighborly thing, I think, to let them finish the year. Uh, and now they would be able to see that it's coming, so next year they could budget for it appropriately. The last thing I want to say is that um, this was my, my thought process, because I, I raised the questions last time. but. The, 25, the, the point of this is that these, these costs accrue. W whether you like it or not, they accrue. And so this is really just a question of who pays for it. Um, do you try and attribute some more of that to the development itself, or do you just go out to all the rate payers and say, well, you know, f over the last five years, X amount of developments happened, and now everybody has to pay in order to build a new station, a pump station, or a new water main, or whatever the case might be. And, I don't, I'm not, it, it's very hard to say this is, again, the direct dollar that came from this project, but I think this is the analysis they did looking at the comps. I think, you know, I don't think we want to do it by bedroom, but um, a lot of folks are thinking solely of 4DR, but I would suggest there's another large project on the horizon that's not 4DR, and if you can imagine that entire development essentially hooking up to our water system for $10,000 of the six-inch main does not sound particularly comfortable. So I just want to put out there that these large-scale developments have a cost. The cost has to be borne somewhere. And this is an effort to balance that. And the phasing is an effort to give people a, a look over the horizon. So I, I think it's worth supporting. Um, I would prefer to keep the numbers in myself. And you could always revisit them and lower them if you wanted to. But at least this way, you'd, you'd be creating an expectation. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. Thank you. Anyone else? Second round, Councilor Khan. No, no, thank you, thank you. And I, and I did just look, opened up the, the two documents, so I, I see all the information here. I think I just asked that maybe this is either in our packet as a communication or on the city's website, that this was very helpful and I appreciate it, so I will be supporting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, further discussion or comments? Ginny, Councilor Donahue. I, I see you, Councilor Donahue. Yes, thank you. Um, I do have a concern about how this might affect affordable housing developments. Um, that is actually a pretty big concern. I feel like inherently it, 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 uh, it might affect um, any kind of major affordable housing project that might be looking to do 100% affordable units. And I'm almost kind of curious, I'm wondering, um, what the appetite needed be to um, sort of have a exemption for affordable units to not interrupt um, that um, the, 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 the motivation to create that and by doing that it might also um, you know, increase the appetite to do more, more affordable units by fall but it would be then um, to some extent. And um, as far as the 1,000 versus 2,500, eventually, um, you know, I don't see why we can't split the difference with like a 1750 now and just leave it at that um, or something similar. But my real concern is how this is going to affect affordable um, housing development. So, if, if there's anyone that might seek to entertain um, an exemption for affordable units, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Seeing no takers on that one, Councilor Donahue. So we have a motion to amend on the floor um, proposed by Council Z, seconded by? Second. Thank you. I might also mention that at some point we have a sponsor that's not here. Yeah. I was so we need to waive the rules and submit another name. So I see someone's hands up. Councillor Cameron's hands up. Just so, so I'm clear. So <clears throat> the amendment is to the adding the sewer, uh, excuse me, system development fee and then the piece about Newbury. 
I, I have the amendment as incorporating all of the changes on your sheet that you handed out. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And those are the changes, correct? Right. Right. The double underlines were already existing. Correct. Right. And the system yep. development fee actually was already inserted last meeting by us, but at just $2,500 flat. We voted on that on the floor here. Okay. So, yeah, this is, okay. so this is amending that amendment, if you will, to put the fees in. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Khan? Yeah, thank you, Councilor President. Um, I just don't want to leave what Councilor Donahue said. I think that's a very valid point, and we all need to be thinking that direction. I do think that there could be relief provided, and I don't know enough yet in terms of when you get the developments in place. I am going to, we have the planning director here. I uh, don't, don't want to put you on the spot, but do you mind maybe um, there might be ways we have these fees, but when it comes to projects that have the 100% affordability or anything like that, in your experience, has there been some type of relief that could be provided at a later date or in that development process? Yeah, Councilor, I was actually thinking the same thing, that uh, based on, you know, depending on the parameters of the project and the need and the desire of the city to support affordable housing, that's an option to revisit the fee at that time or to look for, um, to essentially pay for it from another source, an affordable housing uh, subsidy, if you will, to offset that fee while still putting something in the account, to Councilor Z's point. So I, I was definitely thinking the same thing, that once that project or project come along, that can be a question before you as whether or not to waive fees um, you know, that's the, the question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Further questions? All right. So, wanted to let us, everyone know what we're voting on? This is a roll call on a motion to amend Ordinance 143 as defined system development fee, which I don't know if you want me to repeat. It's 1000 until uh, June 30th, 1500 until June 30th, 2025, and 2500 thereafter. Roll call. Roll call on the motion to amend. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Wallace? I'm sorry, Council Vogel? Yes. Council White? Yes. Council Zeed? Yes. Council Cameron? Yes. Council Donahue? Yes. Council Khan? Yes. Council Sheehan? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Zeed? The motion to amend is on the floor, the, uh, which is a motion approved as amended. I think we need to address this one. Councilor Z. Yeah, motion to waive the rules and um, do you, do you, and Councilor McCauley would like to rule twelve D. Twelve D. Second. So that motion is uh, to uh, waive pursuant to Rule Twelve D the requirement the sponsor be present and we will uh, insert in place Councilor McCauley as the sponsor. Yes. Thank you. Should All we right. vote on that? Roll we'll call. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cannon? Yes. Councilor Dunning? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Sheehan? Yes. Okay, we have a new sponsor. Thank you very much. The motion approved as amended is on the floor. Roll call. Motion approved as amended, Ordinance 143. Um, Councilor McCauley? Yes. Council Preston, yes. Council Vogel, yes. Council Wall, uh, Council Wright, yes. Council Zeed, yes. Council Cameron, yes. Council Dunyu, yes. Council Khan, yes. and Council Shan. Yes. Ordinance first reading passes. All right, committee items, budget and finance. Council Zeed. Okay, uh, thank you, President. Um, so we're going to do the CPC first, and uh, we'll, we'll do them project by project, and everybody will indulge me with the paper flipping I have to do. So the first one is motion to approve project number one, first time home buyer pro program applied to, uh, for by the affordable housing trust in the amount of 250 with a recommendation of 250. Second. 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 Oh, sorry. So um, this is project number one, as I mentioned, the Affordable Housing Trust requested 250,000. The CPC um, concurred with that recommendation and the Committee on Budget and Finance further concurred with a 3-0 vote to tell you a little bit about the project. This is a new program that the uh, Affordable Housing Trust is developing. This is, a, as the title states, is a first time home buyer program. So what this is, is uh, this is a basically down payment assistance. It's not a program that has existed before in the city, at least at this level. So previously, um, 
there were other similar programs but had restrictions like only up to 80% of AMI, average median income, um, and, and in some cases only for deed restricted or in other words big A affordable. This one's a little bit different with a new source of funds. Uh, the idea is to target more people, uh, providing an opportunity for up to 10 to 12 families to be able to take advantage of this. Obviously one of the biggest drivers uh, of recent, not, not all, of all time of course, is, is interest rate increases has really been creating a lot of pressure on uh, home buyers and of course the market being what it is. Uh, this program uh, would have some restrictions, although less than other ones mentioned. There is an asset limit of 75,000. We asked about the application process and how these, uh, these are awarded. It is first come, first serve. Uh, as a reminder, I know we say this number often, but the AMI now in Essex County for a family of four is $140,200 annually. Um, other cities and towns have, have done this. Um, they must uh, purchase a property in Newburyport. The asset limit um, was questioned as well, and that's generally um, uh, pretty common. The 75000 is apparently pretty common and has some basis uh, in state law as well. We did have some public comments. The money is there until it runs out, so it's a first come, first serve, but it uh, basically just stays there until it goes. And the maximum um, award for a person, for an individual or a family applying is $20,000. Um, so that is the story. This is the, the, just one last thing that's general to CPC is, or CPA is that this, the CPC, the Community Preservation Committee, is now working on a 24-month timeline. So when they approve the recommendation and then we ultimately approve it, they give them 24 months to essentially execute. Previously, it was considered more like 12 or even before that, a little bit less formal. And then after the 24, at 24 months, they can ask for an extension and the CPC will grant at their discretion. So again, the committee um, provided uh, a 3-0 recommendation and that is what we bring to you this, uh, this evening. Further questions? All right, roll call on the first one. So motion approval 434? Just project number one. Just project number one. Yeah, we're going to do them one by one, sorry. Okay. And that was seconded by? I'll second it. Thank you. Roll call? Yes. On approving project number one, Council Colley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Council Wright? Yes. Council C? Yes. Council Cameron? is recused. Thank you. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Sheen? Yes. All right. So, Councilor Cameron, no. Clerk Jones, do you mind unmuting yourself? I'll make a motion to approve uh, project number two, Atkinson Common Rock Tower. Second. Second. Thank you. This was applied for by the Parks Commission and the Parks Division. The amount requested is 59,950. The amount suggested or recommended by the CPC was 59,950 with concurrence on the committee three to zero. Um, you heard a little bit about this project briefly in public comment. Um, this, this is the stone tower at Atkinson Common. It was actually originally a WPA project, although it does not have a plaque to that effect. Um, the tower, if you've walked by it or seen it, is not in great shape. Um, it, it has been welded shut for some years. Um, some years ago, the Belleville Improvement Society did make an effort to raise some funds and they put some money into it, uh, removing the original staircase, which was quite unsafe, and having placed in a temporary staircase. Um, there's also been some cleaning of the exterior and the installation of some um, things to help with the structural uh, consideration. So um, this is a phased proposal, uh, not specifically that we're looking at, but the idea here is to phase this in uh, with, the, uh, with the end idea being really overall preservation of the structure itself, at least for the enjoyment of looking at it. We did get into somewhat of a conversation about access to it by the public, and I think that uh, while there's no specific immediate plan to allow that, uh, the general goal would be to maybe try and open it up a few times a year for the public to be able to go to the top, which apparently has very nice views. And we did not do a site visit, but maybe we should, um, and to be able to look out. But th I think conceptually, we had some parks commissioners. The likelihood that it would just be open to the public all the time seems somewhat unlikely for obvious reasons. So this uh, 59,950 is specifically um, 
to fix the concrete and to coat the concrete to inhibit further deterioration. Um, and so that's really what we're talking about now. Um, as mentioned, this is 59K, but the overall project is expected to cost more. 350K is sort of what's envisioned for the overall project. In terms of how do you get from 59K to 350, we had a discussion about uh, possible fundraising. Um, as I mentioned, the BIS or other neighbors who were interested, the Parks Commissioner who liaises for Atkinson was involved in the conversation as well, and then potentially for uh, future CPC uh, requests as well. Um, so uh, you, you know, that's basically what we're talking about here. This is a, a city project, would be a city, so it does have to go through procurement. Uh, it's unclear who, who would do it, but the, the 59,950 was a number that is considered to be correct, or at least in the ballpark. So again, three to zero, uh, and recommended for your approval. All right, further questions? Roll call for number two. Motion to approve project number two. McCauley? Yes. Council McCauley, excuse me. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunia? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Motion to approve project three, uh, Perkins Art and Research Center. Yes. Thank you. This is, uh, was applied for by the Historical Society of Old Newbury. 210,251 was requested, recommended by CPC, and recommended by the Committee on Budget and Finance. We had the Executive Director, Bethany Graf Doral, present to us in committee. Um, the number one issue that they're facing and seek to address with this is space. They're running out of space to put things, and um, they really want to, um, to make that space by basically moving art into the Perkins Building, which is on their campus, specifically the third floor. They have extensive plans for a sliding rack system that's designed to hold the art in a way that protects it, but also makes it accessible and viewable. Um, this uh, amount of funding, 210, is not expected to be the full amount of the project. The full amount is estimated to be 287K or so. So you see 210 here. We did ask, what do you think the source of funding will be for the gap, as we call it? And the answer was, um, other sources, fundraising, uh, potentially ut utilizing some reserves that they have, uh, things along the lines. Um, we also had questions about um, temperature and humidity and preservation, and those are things that they have addressed through testing uh, and, and feel confident that the space is ready. And just as a last reminder, um, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the museum itself is open to Newburyport residents and a few other communities at no cost. So if you'd like to go and visit it, you are invited and can do so. And the committee uh, did recommend, again, three to zero. Thank you, Councilor Z. Discussion? Roll call on number three. Motion to approve project number three. Council McCall. Yes. Council Preston. Yes. Council Vogel. Yes. Council Wright. Yes. Council Z. Yes. Council Cameron. Yes. Council Dunyu. Yes. Council Khan. Yes. And Council Shan. Yes. Thank you. Motion to approve project number four, Newburyport Custom House Masonry Repair. Second. Uh, this was applied for by the Custom House, uh, represented by Christopher Silva, uh, who, who mentioned, introduced himself during public comment, the executive director. 150,000 requested, recommended by CPC, and two to one recommended by the Committee on Budget and Finance. Um, this is a, 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 a exterior project. Uh, as, as I know, I think we've seen in previous years, there's, you know, it's, it's an older building, and sealing the exterior of the building is extremely important. Hard to protect what's inside if the outside is not, um, is not in good shape. So um, specifically, this is you know, facade-related work, the portico roof, as you heard. They're going to redo all of the joints, flashing. Um, you know, the, they have been working with a historic designer or specifications of a designer and a masonry engineer. And some of it that they're replacing or upgrading has been there for quite some time, dating back to 1835. Um, the roof is also going to be leaded copper. That is currently deteriorating, and uh, that has a very long life of something like 100 years. So as I mentioned, the request here is for 150K. The total uh, project here is expected to be 191, so there's a 41K difference there. And the applicant stated that uh, they were looking for grants and similarly to the other project reserves to cover any necessary gap. Last thing is we did ask about the timeline and uh, the goal was to try and start towards the end of fall. Uh, again, the vote was two to one in committee. Thank you. Discussion? Roll we'll call on project number four. Motion to approve project four. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Council White? Yes. Council Z? No. Council Cameron? Yes. Council Daniel? 
Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Sheehan? Yes. Uh, motion to approve Project 5 Downtown Lighting Project. Second. This was 69377 requested, recommended by CPC, and concurred by Budget and Finance. Um, this is specifically to upgrade some lighting downtown um, to LEDs. Uh, many of, as you know, many of the lights in downtown are not in great shape uh, as a result primarily of their age and just the, the natural process that they have kind of a life. I think the first thing to start with this is what this covers and what it doesn't. Um, there are roughly 265 fixtures downtown. This is for 31 of them specifically in parks. And the reason they're specifically in parks is that uh, initially there was an application and an effort to try and do these under historic preservation uh, category of the CPA, but that was deemed to not be acceptable or, or a good idea. So it was trimmed back to 31, and that takes you to Market Square, In Street, and Patrick Tracy Square. So this is specifically now in parks, and that's where the 31 uh, comes from. We did have a good amount of conversation on the rest of them, because clearly there is an interest from counselors as well as uh, business owners, a couple of them who came to our meeting. and. Um, I'm happy to fill you in on that, but specifically on the ones that are in the parks, um, the uh, city electrician, who's relatively new to the position, came and spoke to us. They have focused down on uh, three different lighting fixtures as sort of the final contestants to be selected. They are all LED, and um, basically uh, they've just, they're really starting to narrow down on one of them um, that they feel is going to be aesthetically correct and, and as close to what our existing ones are, as well as meet the lighting needs. Um, specifically, a couple of things that did also come up is, yes, uh, you did the math right if you calculated roughly $2,300 per light, if you just divided 31, um, you know, the, the whatever it is here, 69K. They're expensive, um, that's the reality of, of what these are. Um, second thing is we had a, a decent conversation about green communities and grants and things like that, and these didn't quite make that cut um, because there's a certain level of brightness that's desired because these are for public safety in some reason, in some respects, and also for the recreational aspect of being in a park. So unfortunately, uh, didn't quite meet, meet that line. And of course, this is a CPC application. Um, last thing is, um, you know, the effort here is to use the existing poles and wiring. So this is like a retrofit on the top. So they're not adding more lights and they're not spacing lights out more or spacing them closer accordingly. They're just taking the top off and putting the new ones uh, there, and um, last, last, last thing is that uh, you know this is kind of viewed as okay. This will become the prototype for the rest of downtown, and, and the theory is to continue using this same product, generally speaking, if and when the other the difference in lights can be funded from whatever source they can be funded from. So, three to zero on committee discussion. Roll call on number five. Motion approved project five. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cannon? Yes. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Sheehan? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, next is, I'm going to try and, and do them collectively. If anybody doesn't like that, you can tell me I'm happy to do them separately. But motion to collectively approve six and seven, which are both open space related. Second. Mm -hmm. So number six is a uh, contribution to the open space reserve fund in the amount of 100000 um, as you know, uh, the city maintains an open space reserve fund. In fact, uh, one thing I learned that I didn't know is that each one of the four categories in CPC actually has an associated reserve fund that is created automatically when you accept the CPA. So we use this one quite frequently. Um, this is basically bank. You put it in the bank. Uh, when an open space opportunity becomes available, then you have money to tap. Um, so this is a request for $100,000. Um, it was double checked by the CPC, and, and it, is, it is correct. They were just double checking the, uh, the, the balance. Uh, we're roughly, uh, with this, going to be somewhere, I think, in the $900,000 range, and uh, had a brief conversation about what does it make sense to carry in that account, and if we did another, we might be having potentially a million dollars uh, in the next year or so if, if recent historic trends continue. This 100K is a fairly common amount. Um, we did have the planning director present. Um, there was no, uh, there are no specific opportunities on the horizon to utilize this money, but uh, but again, it, that's you have it in case the opportunity uh, does arise. Uh, there was some conversation about, you know, is there a crossover between water protection that we might like to, and that was actually the last draw. 
And the answer is yes. It sounds like an interesting thing, but of course, this is CPC money, so it does need to meet that requirement, um, the requirements of the CPC. Project number seven is a Colby Farm open space preservation. This is 51,000 all the way through, recommend, requested, recommended, and also recommended by the council. Um, basically, this is two components. One is removal and demolition of an, of an existing horse pasture fence that runs parallel to Low Street. And um, the other one is, uh, is, what am I writing here? In my notes? The other one, so it's a new fence and then growing concert vegetation would also help as well. And then uh, placing sign and kiosk to explain the historic use of the land uh, and that would be designed and developed. So I think those are the two main pieces. They're the fence and the kiosk and the sort of signage there. As you know, this is part of a broader development that resulted in us having this open space. Um, we did also have the planning director talking about um, working on open space uh, management or monitoring, I should say, I think is the right word. So we've, we've, we've had, you may recall, if you've been on uh, some money transferred for the monitoring of open space, and that will continue as well. Um, there was um, an abutter that was present who was concerned and about lot lines, specifically where the land is there. So there was a contingency placed on this one in committee, and the contingency is basically confirm where the property lines are so that this fence signage or kiosk do not end up on private property. And that was uh, amended, therefore, uh, by the committee and is placed in there. And they are working, they have been working on a survey, so that was already um, in the process. And um, in terms of this cost estimate, it came from the fence contractor and the monitoring person. So contingent upon the, the confirmation of property lines, it was three to zero in committee. So that's number six and number seven. All right. Questions? All right. Roll we'll call on approving six and seven. Motion we'll approve for project six and project seven with the contingency that the property lines are confirmed. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Council Wright? Yes. Council Zeed? Yes. Council Cameron? Yes. Council Dunning? Yes. Council Khan? Yes. And Council Shan? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve um, project number eight, Moby Maps, Dune Preservation, and project number nine, Collectively Bike Feasibility Study. Seven. So project number eight uh, was applied for by the Plum Island Taxpayers Association in roughly the amount of 6,700, uh, and that was re recommended and concurred to by budget and finance. Um, these are specifically to uh, buy Moby mats. If you're familiar, if you've walked down the beach, you're probably familiar with these. They're sort of big plastic sidewalks for that lack of a better way to say them. They get rolled out in season and removed. Um, this was uh, um, something that is actually not uh, in the reservation terrace area, which you're, you're used to hearing a lot about, but this is actually more in the 50s, I, I would say, 53, 55th Street, and trying to improve access. Moby mats um, help considerably with accessibility. They're also just much easier for people to walk on, especially if they're bringing gear, wagons, and so forth. Um, they also do help with um, dune preservation because they really encourage people to walk in the right place and try and, and just actually, by making it more attractive to walk somewhere um, keep them from walking in somewhere that we may not want them to, such as through beach grass or dunes. This was uh, an application of the recreation. Um, we did have some conversation about just ensuring that we could delineate you know, the ownership of the mats and that they'd be taken care of and who would take responsibility for them. Plum Island Taxpayer Association uh, agreed to be the applicant and would take responsibility for them. In all likelihood, practically, they would be probably stored with the other Moby mats at, at, the, at the point where they usually go. Um, there is a, was a second emergency application for more Moby mats. That's a separate order that's coming later, so I'm just going to plug that in. So you, I'll just say ditto to what I said now, and when we get to that one. So that is number um, that is number eight. Uh, number nine is the bike feasibility study. We had a long conversation about this one. Um, most probably remember the genesis of this uh, back to sort of COVID 2020-ish time frame. Uh, kids were uh, utilizing Marches Hill to sort of do a homegrown, if you will, uh, bike track, pump track, um, as you might call it, and that led to some concerns from abutters and others who enjoy the park and what it was doing to sort of the environment out there and changing the paths. Um, so there's been some discourse about this over the last couple of years. Fast forward to today, uh, the Parks Commission is really trying to seek to find an answer. And to do that, um, they, they are seeking these funds uh, to, to try and study three sites for sort of feasibility, would, would it work for it? And there were some different sites concern, con, um, considered, pardon me, that probably none of them are really surprised. Marches Hill is certainly on there. 
And then um, there were a couple of other ones as well. Um, then we had some public comment um, sort of for and against and, and concern over it. And generally, the, the Parks Commission chair was stating, you know, we really, if, you, if we need to have a place, otherwise it will get done sort of anywhere and everywhere without any rules. So this one too did get a contingency and that is that we asked the Parks Commission to tell us specifically which three sites are on. Um, Atkinson was sort of discussed, but also, um, you know, but also not 100% clear. It seemed, the only thing that seemed very clear was Marches was gonna be on that list. And the idea was to try and whittle down sites that are feasible. So that was a contingency that was added. And with that contingency, um, in order to try and uh, have continued process, the vote was three to zero on that one. So that's number eight and number nine. All right, for the discussion, roll call. Most improved project eight and nine, uh, nine with a contingency that uh, we be told what the three sites are in total. Councilor McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Z. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Dunyu. Yes. Councilor Khan. Yes. And Councilor Shan. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I know you're getting tired of me, but I'll try and finish them up. Uh, motion to approve collectively 10 Cashman Multi Sport Resurfacing, 11 Atkinson Court, and number 12 Woodman. Second. Number 10 is 61271, applied for by the Parks Commission. Um, this is Cashman Resurfacing. So this is, this is the tennis court. Um, this is not a full reclamation, as, as you might have th be thinking with the knock Mullen courts that were done recently. This is literally a resurfacing, so it's filling in cracks and then um, sort of cleaning up the top. Um, but we had lengthy conversations on 10 and 11 because they're really the same project in a lot of ways, the physicality of filling in cracks and issues like that. Um, they're a little bit different in other ways. But in, in general, it was explained to us that really these should both feel like brand new courts uh, when they're done. Um, so now to speak specifically about both of them, um, Cashman, um, these, are, these are tennis courts, as you know, and basketball um, as well. The, t the tennis courts will be striped for pickleball. There was also some other factors such as fixing the fence, adding a windscreen um, on the riverside because of the wind considerations, backboards. Uh, may also be considered um, as well. Um, as I mentioned, this was for $62,000. If I'm rounding, there was also a $15,000 gift that you may recall we approved maybe three months ago that was shifted over to Cashman, so that will be used towards this, um, this uh, endeavor as well. In contrast, um, Atkinson is also, again, it's a resurfacing and all those things are true. This one will not be striped for pickleball. This is what the high school currently uses to play and that was the subject of much discussion um, during our conversation. But um, their utilization of the court was the, was the reason why the decision was made by the Parks Commission not to stripe it for pickleball. The court's pictures were provided on all, of all, on all of them and obviously they're not in great shape. Um, so that is basically, and the last thing on both of these is we did ask, you know, well, what does it cost comparatively to just rip up the whole court and do it all over from scratch? And it was deemed that, you know, you'd be north of like $300,000. So the resurfacing, which as you can see between the two of these is like 110, is, it should give us about 10, 10 years of life, approximately. The last one, last one of this, of the really of the projects besides the debt and the administrative um, would be project number 12 which is Woodman. Um, Woodman is, again, there were some pictures provided to us as well, but essentially you have a playground that's on site there. The playground is not in great shape. In particular, there are some walkways um, that have been sort of deteriorating. They're, if you've been there, they're, they're brick, and then there's these, um, for lack of barriers that sort of hold everything together and those have been collapsing or just sort of falling out of shape and so that's been causing um, the, the bricks to then move and it just makes the whole thing sort of unsafe. Um, there's an uh, accessibility concern there as well and this will help with that too. Um, this will be done out of house and I should have said it's, it's uh, 57K uh, requested on this one. Um, but it was estimated by Mike Hennessy using his experience um, in, in this world and in the contracting world as well. So all three of these were recommended to you with, without any amendments or contingencies by a vote of three to zero. Further discussion? Roll call. Motion approved projects 10, 11, and 12 collectively. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunning? 
Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Shane? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so next is to motion to approve the debt payments out of CPA in the amount of $700,000 and change. Second. So we talked about this for a little bit. Um, obviously, th this is uh, starting to reflect now some of the projects that have uh, been recently funded or approved in addition to some other ones. Um, we have $702,000 of debt payments, as I mentioned, um, the NHS uh, bond payment, Cherry Hill, Fuller Field, and then the, the new ones are Market Landing and Bartlett Mow. Um, we did have, have actually a decent conversation on this, um, and in particular, we talked about a couple things. One is uh, when, it, when some of the, date, the dates are going to be rolling off or when some of these are going to be rolling off. Um, sorry, my notes are lengthy here. But uh, yeah, so the NHS stadium bond payment is the oldest, and that'll be rolling off, I think, in five-ish years. So I, I'm not going to. Um, Fuller was, is a 15 year, and it was issued two years ago, so it doesn't have 13 years. Stadium was 15 years. It was issued five years ago. Cherry Hill is 15 years in total, and it was issued about 10 years ago. So it gives you a sense of when things are going to start to roll off. Um, the borrow at now is still in process, so no debt has actively been issued on that project. Um, and uh, our understanding from the update that we received, since we sort of used the opportunity just to get that, was that they were, the administration was going before Conservation Commission to get their approval, and that I, we, we are all aware that the City Council has another vote on that project at some point. Um, that was a contingency when it was passed last year, but the project is uh, moving forward. And then on Market Landing, project you've heard quite a bit about. Unfortunately, I went out to bid. It came in uh, at, a, at a significant inc uh, overage compared to what was estimated. You probably recall the project's roughly 5.4, not all from CPC, but uh, a ch good chunk of that from CPC, and then some grants and the, and the um, um, trust fund money that we extracted, about a million dollars. So that uh, was estimated at 5.4, came in roughly three, three and a half over, unfortunately. So it went out to a rebid. It is due back, I guess, in a couple of days is my understanding. Um, so no debt has been issued on that one as well. Um, but uh, the, the finance director did, upon questioning, did feel that uh, the placeholder should be left for the debt uh, in, the, in the sense that it, it should be issued at some point. If it does not get issued before this fiscal year closes, then uh, we, are, we understand that the money would close back to CPC and then may create a balance that could be attributed or given to other topics. Uh, other projects uh, in the next round or as an emergency application. All right. Zero on that. And oh, I just wanted to say um, now break on the committee report just for myself. I voted yes on this and I'm going to vote on it tonight. But I just want to reiterate that I think it was it was not a great idea to put this much in debt, in my humble opinion. But I'm voting yes because I think you have to meet your obligations. It wasn't my choice necessarily to issue all of these. But what are you going to do? You have to pay your bills. So that's my personal view, um, and that's why I'll be supporting. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councilor Z, further discussion? Roll call. Motion approved the debt collectively in the amount of $702,170. Awesome. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Council Wright? Yes. Council Z? Yes. Council Cameron? Yes. Council Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Okay, last one on CPC is motion to approve the administrative cost in the amount of 14000 Second. Um, this is um, primarily for uh, a member of the planning office who a portion of the salary is paid for out of the CPC. This is pretty standard amount, 14K is standard. 3 0 on committee. Okay. All right, roll call. I'm approving administrative cost, 14000 Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunning? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Shan? Yes. A couple more. Um, motion to approve um, order 441 and 442 collectively. So 441. These are also CPC related, which is why I just try and do them collectively here. So the first one is 441, which is $30,000. At the beginning of the CPC process, we asked for a list of projects that had been funded in the past but have not yet been expended. This was identified on that list, and I think that this dates back, as you see here, back to FY 2016, so 2015, has not, uh, had not gone to productive use in that time. So we asked what might happen with it, and this, this was the answer. Um, 
So essentially they're returning the $30,000 back to the CPC and then we are placing it into a reserve fund. So remember earlier I said all four categories have a reserve fund. This actually has zero balance. So this would be a first deposit into that reserve fund. We cannot take this 30 and use it on other, we couldn't use this for Atkinson just by way of example because it would break our required contribution towards the, historic, uh, towards the affordable housing category of CPC all the way back from FY15. So we can't reach back in and just say we're taking the 30 for something else. So this will remain in reserve just as the open space reserve fund does. We had a conversation about that. So that's what this one is. And then order 442 is that emergency application. Um, this is for the reservation terrace area. Things were flying pretty quickly as the sand was getting placed on the beach. And now, if you haven't been out there, go take a walk. It's, it's really quite uh, amazing. I was out there this afternoon. Um, but this idea was to, to try and get a little bit more Moby Mat, do some signage, and, and really make a continued good faith effort to protect the beach and, and also make it accessible for the public. So this is a recreation. So that's 441 and 442. Both are 3 0 out of committee. Thank you, Councilor Z. Discussion? Roll call. Motion to approve uh, orders 441 and 442 collectively. Council McCauley? Yes. Council Preston? Yes. Council Vogel? Yes. Council Wright? Yes. Council Zed? Yes. Council Cameron? Yes. Council Dunyu? Yes. Council Cameron? Yes. And Council Sheehan? Yes. Thank you. Okay, last up is or, uh, motion to approve order 435. Second. This is an acceptance of the Buildings Up grant. Um, so this was a, this is in the amount of $5,000. This was applied for and awarded to the Newburyport Energy Advisory Committee. Um, they uh, saw this opportunity from the U.S. Department of Energy, and I guess that this is a program that they're awarding roughly $22 million in cash prizes and technical assistance to help develop innovative uh, initiative models and leveraging billions in federal funding for energy efficiency. I forwarded you the memo provided. But probably the most important information from a local perspective is that the Energy Advisory uh, Committee uh, is trying to help the city meet the net zero and roughly a third of the energy use is due to heating and cooling. And the issue that they're trying to address specifically with this is how to convert older homes to electric heat pumps while being uh, sensitive to the historic character of those homes. So they're trying to develop a, a proposal titled Electrifying Old Homes with Care. So this $5,000 doesn't do all that. It, it helps get them 10 hours of technical time from somebody to help them. Then I guess they apply for a second round of grants. In that case, it's $200,000 if they get awarded that amount. Then they will get actually have a little bit more bite to get the work done. The committee did talk about this and recommends it 3 to 0. Thank you, Councilor Z. Discussion? Roll call. Motion to approve order 435. Council McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. That's it for budget. Just a few quick reminders. One is um, uh, thank you to my colleagues. We're going to be meeting tomorrow instead of Thursday. They're very gracious to accommodate me, and I appreciate that. So we will have our regular standing meeting tomorrow instead of Thursday, and that's all posted and everything is done with that. At 6 o'clock, I'm getting a look here. Point of order. Do you have a transaction? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so ready to be done. My mistake. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, motion to approve transfer 150, 30,000 free cash to City Hall for HVAC. Second. So uh, there's a little bit in the memo. We did talk a little bit about this. So uh, apparently City Hall is a Frankenstein of heating and cooling systems that serve all sorts of different parts of the, um, of the building. But in specifically, in this instance, there was a unit that failed that serves primarily Andrew's office. So if you like Andrew, you could help him get some heating and cooling before the summer. If you don't, you cannot do that. And then the HR office, so sort of that block of space over there. Um, the, um, the DPS is primarily spearheading this as they do for most city hall things. And they're seeking $30,000 in order to essentially replace those units and uh, get cooling in place by summertime. Um, we did ask, you know, are there any other funding sources that were considered? And, and the finance director stated, you know, possibly there are some things they could cobble together to get to 30, but free cash um, seemed to be the best. And that actually prompted another question, which is, hey, what's up with free cash? And the answer is that um, you, you're probably used to seeing the big spring, you know, capital spend, not capital improvement. We're actually going to have a, a raft, I guess, coming with budget. So budget season is going to be budget plus CIP plus uh, spending for FY, whatever it is, 24 right now. So 
we're all on this ride together and we'll find out how that goes. But we will have lengthy meetings and, uh, but so this was three to zero out of committee. Sorry, thank you for catching me on that. I don't want anything back in committee. <laughs> Discussion. Roll call. Motion to approve transfer 150, Council McCauley. Yes. Council Preston. Yes. Council Vogel. Yes. Council Wright. Yes. Council Z. Yes. Council Cameron. Yes. Council Dunning. Yes. Council Khan. Yes. And Council O'Shan. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize. Thank you. So yeah, so we're meeting tomorrow. That's our standing meeting. Uh, Six o'clock. We'll be here. Um, you saw the budget schedule. I just put it in for receiving file. But um, if there's any questions, please let me know. As I mentioned, it's really a new year uh, between trying to do all these things. So we've tried to, you'll see some workshops have two nights for the same theme, the same departments, and now you know why, because we are gonna try and talk about their budget, their CIP, and if they have spending associated well. As well, I thank Andrew and Ethan for helping me coordinate all the department heads availability. So it was a, it was a big effort, and we will see how it goes. Hopefully we'll have enough time. And that's it for budget. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. Uh, community services, Councilor McCauley. Uh, motion to approve ordinance 148. Second. Uh, this ordinance is an update of uh, uh, municipal fees, recycling, and solid waste. Uh, Massachusetts passed a recent law uh, went into effect in November that mattresses can no longer be put in the trash. Uh, we, so we've, uh, the change here is to take mattresses out of the trash. Uh, and remove them. Uh, they can be recycled. Uh, our recycling vendor went up uh, $5. It, that's reflected in the fee here along the way. Uh, mattresses that are completely, that are not recyclable can be transported um, to Mellow. The city's no longer being involved in that. Uh, similarly, with propane tanks, we used to take them uh, for a dollar. Uh, there's more um, hazard and problems with that. Uh, we're choosing not to take that. There are other places, multiple other places, that take uh, gas grills uh, for free. And so therefore, um, these are the changes proposed, and the sustainability director was there, and we approved it three to zero. Thank you, Dr. Discussion? Roll call. So motion to approve ordinance 148 on the first reading. Council McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Zee? Yes. Councilor Cannon? Yes. Councilor Dunning? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Shannon? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion to uh, move ordinance uh, 149 to a date certain of May 5th. Second. Uh, the reason being is we have an incoming uh, president, as we heard tonight uh, from uh, the Friends of Council of Aging, uh, during the fire drill break, I was able to chat and uh, determine that there were some misconceptions going on and that uh, we'll use this time uh, to close that gap and to get consensus moving forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilor McCauley. Nothing else from Community Services? Yes. Roll call. Roll call. I'm moving um, ordinance 149 to date certain of May 5th. Council McCauley. Is it May 8th? Sorry. To May 8th, excuse me. Council McCauley. Yes. Council Preston. Yes. Council Vogel. No. Council Wright. Yes. Council Z. Yes. Council Cameron. Yes. Council Dunyu. Yes. Councilor Khan? No. Councilor Sheehan? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, nothing else, thank you. Thank you. All right, general government. So first one on the list, motion to approve order 438, the election calendar for 2023. Second. Uh, the committee met, we voted two to zero to bring this out to approve. This is the early voting in-person election calendar. It gives us the calendar for the if we have a primary and it gives us the calendar for early voting for the regular election this year. Uh, the clerk was there explaining the, the times. The times are 30 minutes before and after opening and 30 minutes before closing as all the equipment has to be removed from the senior center and brought back to City Hall, which is why the times are the way they are set. There is a one late night, I believe it's the Thursday night, and I believe we've got Saturday too. So we've agreed to approve two to zero. Discussion? 
Roll call. Motion to approve um, order 438, the election calendar. Council McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Zeed? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunning? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Sheehan? Yes. Thank you. Moving right along, we motion to receive and file communication 472, the letter from Kathleen O'Connor Ives. This is the letter that uh, Ms. Ives sent regarding uh, public speaking in council, uh, making sure that they are not interrupted, that people have the right to speak. Uh, we all heard this loud and clear, so everyone will have the opportunity to speak. Uh, the clerk did speak on behalf of, for public comment where we did mention that we still should keep it civil and we should still keep it to an agenda item. So we all agreed that that was the appropriate path forward. And the committee at that point were up to three, so we voted three to zero to receive and file. Discussion? Roll call. Motion to receive and file communication 472. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunning? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Last but not least, communication 476, the ad hoc on Market Landing Park operations phase. We agreed to receive and file this three to zero. Uh, so for folks who are reading this, this is the second phase of the ad hoc for Market Landing Park. This phase, we are trying to put together the plan for how the park's gonna operate, how it's going to be, how we can keep it financially feasible. Um, we're going to review the waterfront trust documents, try to wrap up what that looks like after we complete the park. Uh, looking at the governance structure, looking at the finances, this is where we were discussing the original bench policy that Councilor McCauley had brought in. Uh, plan on looking at that and probably expanding it to some other items that can help in the park's maintenance. And then um, we will have a final report that will be submitted to folks, to the council by November, so the end of this year. But yes, once we get this started, uh, hopefully soon, we'll start meeting more regularly. Discussion. Roll call. That was on the motion to approve, correct? Communication? Mm -hmm. Receive and file. Receive and file, thank you. Yes. Communication 476. Councilor right. McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. And Councilor Sheehan? Yes. All right, as far as general government goes, we do have our committee meeting next Monday at 5.30 where we will be discussing solely the Brown School RFI. Count, um, Director Port's going to give me his updates. I sent him mine, but we have a few other things to add to it. I want to get that updated so that folks have the opportunity to see it posted this week. Uh, so that's going to be next Monday at 5.30. And that is it for general government. Uh, license and permits. Uh, yes, thank you. Motion to receive and file communication 475. Second. Uh, so this was the um, information we received from the firehouse with how they were going to uh, move their um, the shanties. Um, so this is just a clearing of the docket. It was voted out of committee three to zero. Further discussion. All right. Roll call. Motion to receive and file communication 475. Council McCauley? No. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Z? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve application uh, 130. So this is an application by the new store, the Basin um, uh, approval, uh, Apparel Company, right there where um, Urban, the Urban store was. And this is a request for, from the period starting next month um, through um, Halloween, to use uh, two spaces along the public way. One of the spaces is right in front of their store, uh, uh, what is a 20 foot wide or 21 foot wide sidewalk and they're gonna put a tent um, outside their door. So less than half or about half of that space will be taken up by a 10 by 10 tent. They'll take it down every night. Um, it's to attract 
you know, obviously to attract people along the way. Um, but again, it'll be taken down every night. The other place for the tent, there's a, you can see on the map or the drawing that's in here around the corner. There's a walkway along the building and then between the sidewalk there's, uh, and that walkway there's a, some green space, uh, some green grass, and they'll be putting it up there as well. We had quite a discussion. It was, it was interesting. They're looking forward to um, serving the community down there. You know, we all know this, the, this company and the, the, their generosity to the community. And uh, if you haven't been in the store, it, it's quite appealing. So um, it came out of committee three, nothing to approve, and uh, I'll leave it to any of the other committee members if they have any comment. Further discussion? Roll call. Motion approved. Oh, sorry, Councilor Z. I'm um, just, uh, maybe I'm missing it because I'm tired, but wh where does it say the dates that this was? Yeah, it is, it is tricky. I didn't even know that this um, existed, but it's um, essentially, if you look at, um, I guess that what would be page, well, let's see. Mine doesn't have it, so it's page, it says two or three, and then it goes down as the next one. It tells you uh, outdoor display and enclosures, and it tells you license, initial um, section seven, or paragraph seven says initial licenses, unless um, um, revoked, shall remain effective until on or about October 3rd. Um, Thursday, 31st. Uh, and, uh, October 31st, and commencing on or about May 1st. You see that? I do. Yeah, um, I didn't even know this existed either. Well, th this that that was the um, when we did some reform and we did the initial license and then the, the additional after that the second year and third year if there's no changes. So, is that the intent here? Is that in next year they wouldn't need to apply? They can go through the clerks. Did that come up in the conversation? Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think it did. Did it? I, it did not come up in the conversation. I believe that this is just a one-time application um, at the moment. That's how I understand it. Okay. I can go back to the applicant and we leave it. Um, okay. Well, I, I would just say, if, if, because I think that the annual and then the renewal, I haven't looked at the ordinance in a while, specific to dining. This is obviously not dining, but we did have a section about outdoor displays and it got really complicated and flower boxes and all this stuff. But okay. if the understanding of the committee and the understanding of the applicants just for this year, then I would just suggest if the clerk can write that somewhere that this is valid until October, whatever make up a date and that um, we can reapply if you wish. If that would be, just to, for all, a complete clarity would be appreciated. Other than that, I'm, I'm all set. Thank you, Councilor Seed. That's um, ministerial, then I'll, I don't need to make a motion. I think it's yeah. a good point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Roll call. Motion approved application 130 for 2023 only. Council McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Zeed. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Dunia. No. Councilor Khan. Yes. And Councilor Sheehan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that's it for tonight. Um, we will be meeting next Wednesday night. We have a slug of uh, applications on the um, uh, that came in tonight, and there's one left over from uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, we'll be meeting next Wednesday night at 5:30. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. That's all. Councilor Cameron. Uh, thank you. Uh, nothing to report out of committee this evening. Uh, we did have the joint hearing with the planning board last Wednesday that many of you attended regarding short-term rentals. Uh, so thank you for your participation there. We'll um, be covering all four of these items uh, to one shape or degree uh, that are currently in committee. I know we have a couple of appointments as well, uh, but we'll be meeting uh, Thursday, May 4th at 6 o'clock hybrid in also in New York. Okay. All right. Councillor McCauley, I believe you are pinch inning. Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, motion to uh, uh, kind of a point of order here as well. Uh, so we have, uh, as submitted, um, communication 473, uh, which is the parklet update. And yet we had um, communication 481. Uh, was submitted tonight, which is actually the update, the amended version that should have been the amended version in the packet now. Uh, it, it simply, uh, so communication 481 um, is actually um, the amended version of communication 473. 
imposter. So I'll talk. Uh, 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 so motion to approve 473. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, here's a list of um, uh, the outdoor dining establishments that uh, will need outdoor dining and parklets um, uh, going forward. Now, on this application that you see here today, there are some blanks. Um, the amended version that we got tonight fills in those blanks. And all they say is uh, APA submitted either with changes or with no changes, uh, that is. And the, the APA is uh, a requirement now from the Newburyport Licensing Committee. Um, so they take that uh, application for permit uh, uh, alterations and they send that into Boston and align that with the ABCC uh, going forward. Um, that is still pending, um, so all of these these changes that are here being submitted are pending from the licensing commission. Um, in the past, the uh, city council through the clerk's office has been the lead on this. Now, since we've passed our ordinance um, codifying outdoor dining, the licensing commission is now taking the lead on this and we are now getting informed from the licensing, licensing commission what they are approving and what they are not approving. So what you see here, again, in the amended 481 that was submitted tonight is a complete list of all of the dining establishments with their changes uh, that were here uh, going forward. So uh, I ask that we approve these um, so that we can begin uh, building out their parklets uh, along the way. Thank you. Everyone understood what we just went through. <laughs> Discussion? Councilor Z, then Councilor Khan. Well, <laughs> I guess well, first is a dumb question. I'm sorry. What does APA stand for? Am I supposed to know? Application for permit alteration. Ah, okay. So that's that's a late. Okay. And then the, the second question is um, the uh, I don't know if I want to call it a negotiation, but the space, the amount of spaces they're getting, and all that. Does this list and this imply that? that's all been taken care of and everybody's getting what they're getting and they're either happy or accepting of it? Councilor McCauley. Uh, yes, so uh, the only real change was over at Paddle Inn, uh, the abutter next to uh, Paddle um, uh, a lot had allowed in the previous two years uh, an extension of the park lane in front of their spot, uh, no longer wanted to participate in that, so the Paddle had to adjust their spot that had some realignment of the parklet in front of Carmine and then realignment of the parklet slightly in front of Brian going forward. But uh, this, what you see here, represents um, that negotiation already done. Thank you, Council President. Um, just to clarify, so we got, I, I did see the, the communication we got that has the amendments to it. And I, I would like to see us, um, if we do bring that in and vote on it and approve it, would we need to, uh, and maybe clarification for the chair, that amendment that came in, um, was that just an error and that should have been here in this spot, just so I'm understanding the one that came in? In my opinion, it was a clerical error and it should have been uh, uh, amended. Uh, I'm not the chair of this and I didn't find out about it until today. Okay. Great, because I, I, I'm fine with approving that version because that seems to be the updated with all the drawings too. So um, I don't think an emergency preamble is needed since that was since it's clerical mistake. But I was just going to say it's helpful to see those drawings and uh, that's what we should be voting on. Thank you. Uh, Councilor that was my question. Okay. All right. Well, um, Councilor Z. Sorry, I'm still um, just <laughs> processing this. Uh, so. First thing is, um, I always find it weird to approve a communication personally. That's just my thing. But so maybe, I don't know if next year it should be, because we're actually granting permission to use, the, so that there really could be an order, in my opinion, my, my thought. But, and, and it could have dates and all that. But mechanically, maybe for the clerk, I mean, how are we going to clean all this up? Should we amend 473 to be replaced by 481 and then just receive and file 481? <coughs> to get a clean outcome? Yes, I would say so. Um, it's actually was a timing issue 
because some of the updates were not available to the office when we put this together last week, then this came in. So do you like- Timing issue. But um, yes, so the updated one is the one that came in. So, so I make a motion to replace um, uh, with uh, 180, 480, 473, 473 with communication 481. Second. As amended. That's good. Yeah. And then collectively to also receive and file 481 and just be done with it. Does that need an emergency? Because that came in tonight. I think it would be safer if you did. So all of that together. 473 replaced by 481. 481 emergency. 481 receive and file. Then it's all done in one shot. Point of order, but we're actually, if we're replacing it with 481, now you're making two 481s. You're receiving and filing one, and then you're activating another one. No, it's emergency premium bling. Approving one and receiving filing the other. So yeah, only in the emergency for the Well, that's fine. Yeah. OK. I, 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 <laughs> All right. Everyone understand the massive intent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Roll call. <laughs> As stated by Council Z. <laughs> <laughs> Eloquently. Council McCauley. Yes. Council Preston. Yes. Council Vogel. Yes. Council White. Yes. Council Z. Yes. Council Cameron. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Councilor Donahue. No. Councilor Khan. Yes. And Councilor Shan. Yes. Okay. Eight yes, one no, two absent. Councilor. No, nothing else. Sure. Councilor Khan. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Um, no, I. It's it's great to see this, but one of the things I, I was wondering, and I should have asked, uh, in terms of the public's. Uh, comments on, on this since we are approving spaces um, for the parklets and I know the the chair of the committee is not here but in terms of like public comment were there any public comments on this and also does the Disabilities Commission take a look because a lot of it's like also the diagrams talk about ADA compliance and I think in the committee report I didn't hear that I mean I approved it because I, I am in favor but it'd be nice to hear what statements were made. Council McCauley. Sure. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'll go back and do the committee report on that then. Um, uh, we did look at this. Uh, public comment was taken both at the Licensing Commission as well as um, this, uh, this committee meeting as well. Uh, there was limited at this committee meeting. There was more at the Licensing Commission that went forward. We're, ba we're basing our approvals based upon the uh, NLC's recommendations and approvals. Uh, um, uh, frankly, up until two weeks ago, the state hadn't approved outdoor dining yet, so everything was kind of compressed at this time frame. Uh, in our ordinance, we had written that um, without changes, it would be an administrative uh, type of, of uh, uh, approval going forward, and most, if not all, of these were no changes going forward. So we didn't. So we saw this mostly as administrative. Those ones with changes really had to do with the parklet shifting issue that I had mentioned earlier. On that, um, before any parklet is rolled out, uh, and before any um, tables or chairs or any other things are rolled out into the parklet, our RADA coordinator uh, does a walkthrough. Um, and is uh, and does a weekly walkthrough uh, of each one of the uh, facilities to make sure the five feet, the unobstructed, uh, the one side of the sidewalk, not both, those types of things. Uh, all of the things that we've put in our ordinance are in compliance with. Uh, they've also uh, talked about having uh, additional part-time help to do things on the weekends so things don't get out of hand, um, you know, Saturday and Sunday when it's overly crowded uh, along the way. So those are the things we're all grappling with in this, uh, uh, in this world post-COVID as we're trying to get back together. I hope that answers your question. That's very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions on that one? All right. Good of the order. All right. Councilor, I'm sorry, Clerk Jones. <laughs> okay, so at this point we are at the executive session. Um, I'm going to read um, why we're going into executive session. Then um, the president would entertain a motion, and then um, I think the president would also state that there's no plan to come back 
out of executive session, we would end the meeting at that point. The executive session um, is pursuant to Chapter 30A, Section 21, for uh, the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to potential litigation involving roadways, buildings, and land use, including but not limited to Doyle Drive in Newburyport, Mass. We need a roll call to go in. So moved. Second. Roll call. On a motion approved to go into executive session for the aforesaid reasons, Council McCauley. Yes. Council Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Zed. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Dunyu. Yes. So uh, we will be signing off Councilor Dunyu, as I understand it. Correct. So. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Right. And Councilor Khan. Yes. And Councilor Shan. Yes. We are now in executive session.